All right. First thing that I want to mention here, and then I'm going to kick it back to you guys to kick this thing off. Number one, we want to rise the tide here in the industry. Okay. It's only going to be helpful for you to have professionals surrounding you in this industry. So share this video, like the video, subscribe to the channel. The more interaction on this live stream that we can have, the more shares, share it to an agent friend of yours, share it to somebody in the office, share it to a team member, share it to a managing broker. I can't tell you how many DMs, how many text messages I have received from multiple managing brokers, managers of offices who feel like they are lost because they're not getting clear direction from leadership. Share it. Go ahead and share it with your manager, share it with your mother, share it with your father, share this video with one person right now because we are going to dive into it in a major way and we're going to help rise the tide. It's important for those of you that are professionals that this happens. Uh, second thing I want to mention here on the kickoff, change is absolutely inevitable. Okay. Being better every single day, being a better version of the professional who serves the clients is all about accepting the change. Now, I don't even believe for our business practices, this is a massive change. I heard Lisa mentioning you know, some things about NAR. There might be massive change on how we associate, how we unify, uh, how we band together. But for those of you that appreciate change as making you better, uh, recognize this as an absolute opportunity. So change is inevitable. It's everywhere around us. For those that don't like change, you can hit up Tom Tool. There's a place in um, Pennsylvania that I that I think the Amish appreciate no change, right? But everywhere else in the world, we've got to appreciate change. Uh, the the other the third thing I want to mention is this is version one. The slides that I'm going to share, which all slides will be shared with all of you. These slides are version one. Okay, so there's more to come, but there are concrete things that we know right now. Um, that are absolutely going to be a part of our business. And we need to understand those. We need to implement a whole bunch of those right away. And we're going to go through that with you guys all here today. This is our Knowledge Brokers panel. If you're not familiar with Knowledge Brokers podcast, maybe you can drop a link and go ahead and subscribe to that at some point. Tom, every Friday, you myself, Lisa, we do a knowledge brokers podcast where we look back on the same on the week. What are the most important topics? And then we break it down in a tactical format. We lead that podcast in one particular way each and every single week, Tom. Uh, why don't you go ahead and kick it off for us so we can lead in the same format? So Byron, if you're not getting educated about all things in the market, real estate, knowing what's going on with industry trends, whether you're an attorney, an accountant, title, mortgage, obviously a real estate agent, you're doing yourself and most importantly, your client base a disservice. So this is the Knowledge Brokers panel. I think this is the first panel that we've done. And obviously we're here. Byron and I had a very reactionary podcast on Friday. I think the news dropped, what, 20 minutes before we jumped on the pod to film. And not surprising that you know, something happened here, but I don't think people thought this settlement was going to happen as quickly as it did or settle at all based on some of the NAR commentary that was out there. Here we are. I don't know about you guys. I've been hearing this from other parents at my kid's Boy Scout troop. I've been getting texted from people that I went to college with that I haven't heard from in 20 years. This is all over the place. And if you're not getting educated about it, you're in trouble as a professional because this is I've had clients talk to me about it, potential clients. I mean, buyers, sellers, the CEO of our title company, lenders, everybody is asking what's going on here. And the intent, like Byron said, is here's what we know right now. This is going to change. And I've also will we'll caution you. There's places you don't want to go for information. Lisa, I know you want to talk about this because I've spoken to the chairman of our local board. I've spoken to our attorney. I've spoken to the legal counsel for the Pennsylvania Association of Realtors just to name a few. And it's amazing that you're getting some different information from all of these people that are supposed to be experts. One is because they're reading a legal settlement. And I don't know, Lisa, I think you read the whole thing four times by now. It, it's confusing to read, right? There's some room for interpretation. So all we're going to focus on right now are known quantities and what to do with your business with those known quantities, because there's going to be more that comes out. 1.0 version, Byron, that's a great way to put this because there's going to be stuff here 
that gets interpreted differently. It's still a proposal. It's not approved. And then we've got this other buyer side lawsuit that a lot of people aren't talking about in Illinois. So a lot to unpack here. And that's why we're here to deliver the knowledge to our industry. Yeah, this this proposed settlement, not in, uh, you know, in place yet proposed settlement covers sell side, right? There's a whole bunch of information we put out of BAM uh, about NAR. I think that that is the biggest change, but how you conduct your business, the place that you get to is pretty much unchanged in a lot of ways. Uh, we're going to go through the specific changes that we need to hit on. Uh, again, if you're unfamiliar with me, I'm Byron Lazine, run a team in Connecticut of uh, over 500 transactions last year, over 700 the year before. Lisa Chinati, Boston, Massachusetts uh, region, that major metro. L Lisa also operates in New Hampshire, also operates uh, in Connecticut a little bit. Not a lot of bit, just a little bit for those uh, unfamiliar. But Lisa's uh, upwards of the thousand transaction per year um, you know, count. Tom Tool, the greater Philadelphia area, mainline Philadelphia also in the 500, 600 plus transaction count per year. So point is we're, we're observing a lot of transactions each and every single month, each and every week. And we want to hopefully break this down on a level. All of us have been agents, all of us been in the industry a long time that we can easily understand it. So let's get into these next steps post the NAR settlement. Uh, myself, Tom, Lisa, we're going to go through these. Then we have a special guest around in about 20, 25 minutes that we're going to bring on the panel, Chris Gianos. Chris has built an independent brokerage. He's built one of the largest teams in the country. He spent time at Zillow, and now he runs a company called Humanize around recruiting and training. He's going to talk to us about how we can accept the, the new skill set required to move forward. How can we accept training and implement training here towards the end of the panel? So uh, I believe, Bobby, we've got the slides up. Let's go ahead and get into it. Again, everybody is going to get a copy of these slides. So let's get into the next steps and what we know right now. What we know from the proposed settlement is that there is no co-op requirement. There may be many that are cheering that on, that, that requirement that NAR and MLSs have had for years. That is gone. There's no longer a co-op requirement. And we also know that there will be no buyer comp, buyer compensation offers inside of the MLS. There'll be no buyer comp fields in the MLS moving forward. I want to make this clear. Whether the settlement as proposed currently goes through exactly this way or not, DOJ is going to chime in for sure. There could be tweaks. There could be changes. These things right here, including no buyer comp offer in the MLS, are certain. They're baked in the cake. The buyer compensation field in the MLS, when it goes away in mid-July or whenever, will be gone forever. L let's all understand that. Uh, number three, that being said, compensation offers can still be made. Okay, so uh, if you watched Sharon's video, president of real uh, earlier this week, he did a beautiful job of articulating. We're going to end up in the same place, but we're going to take a different route to get there. We're going to talk more about that buyer up uh, compensation offers from a seller will still be there. They can still be made. Uh, buyers uh, are going to be signing a buyer representation form for some states, not a big change, not a big deal at all. For other states, there will be a comfort level with getting familiar with a new form, but there was always a form during the, the purchase agreement phase. You may be doing it earlier in the process. Um, commissions are and always have been negotiable. We know that right now. We've known that for years. Public might be a little bit confused on that. It's our job, not CNN's, not, Fo not uh, CNBC, not anybody else's to articulate that fact, our job, your job to do that. Lisa, um, what we know right now. Yeah, well, so I think kind of digging in, right? I think there's what we know and then kind of looking at what is the move forward? Um, and I think some of the big points are 
that while some markets have necessitated buyer agency contracts, New Hampshire being one of them, at any point to work with a buyer, I think some of the big changes are going to be working with buyers and getting them to sign the buyer agency contract before you can show. I think understanding offers of comp in MLS are going away, no doubt. I think that there's going to be some pivots and understanding playing within the guidelines of how offers of compensation can be made, whether it's through credits, which can be offered there, but have to be given to a buyer regardless of whether they have representation um, or whether they're choosing to represent themselves or work directly with the listing agent, those offers of comp to the buyer still need to exist if offered there. I think some gray area, a lot of what I'm hearing is ways to circumvent. Can it be posted in showing time? Can it be posted in other areas to kind of play in the gray a little bit? And I think that that's something that we all need to be super careful of and give some thought to as it all continues to shake out. Yeah, a couple points on this, Byron. So, you know, the the uh, buyers to sign a buyer rep form um, and, and Pennsylvania has been one of those states where licensing law, law calls for this. It might need to get signed earlier. Here's what's not going to work. Hey, we'll sign it after we go under contract. We're going to have a right. loose arrangement and there may be different steps to this. Hey, let's let's have a week long test period and see how it goes. And if you like what you see, maybe we extend to a month. And this is going to be something where you need to listen to your state's guidelines. Every state is different. I mean, we we have agents that are in Delaware, New Jersey. It, it, every state's different. So I, I want to really stress, you've got to know your state laws. And there's not going to be a gray area here anymore. Uh, it was a lot like when the pandemic hit where everyone had to get those COVID-19 notices signed and some people did and some people didn't. Well, here's the difference. COVID-19 went away. At least the pandemic laws did. This is not. This is going to be the new rules of engagement moving forward. The offers of comp still being made. This is going to test your systems as an agent, especially a listing agent. Yeah. Think about the home. We had a home we just sold last week and it had 26 offers in on it. And there was 50 plus showings. This has existed in commercial real estate for a long time. Sometimes they offer compensation. Sometimes they don't. I worked at a commercial firm very briefly early in my career. And you're going to have to come up with a system that's not going to bog you down and turn you into a receptionist of answering, hey, here's our offer of comp. Hey, here's our offer of comp. Because that's what a lot of agents are going to do. And that could be literally hours on the phone. And that's not necessarily an income producing activity. So systems will be very important here as well. And obviously, the, without the entitlement to buyer compensation, and you're going to hear me say this a lot, you got to nail your appointments. You have to have a very compelling meeting with clients up front, explaining everything, knowing all the guidelines, all the rules in your state, all the paperwork, because the reality is the COVID market created a lot of weak agents that cut corners because it was easy. This is to combat that exact behavior. And maybe it flushes out a lot of those people that want to cut corners and don't want to sit down, explain the process, go through all those steps. And I would argue, besides the no co-op requirement and the, the no buyer uh, comp offers in the MLS, a lot of these things we're talking about, commissions being negotiable, signing a buyer rep form, good agents were doing that in the first place. So I think that that's what we all want to kind of internalize here is that Strong agents probably have been practicing this for years. I see in the comments, there's a lot of people that said that was the case. So there, there's a lot to think about here in terms of how to run your business with these new rules once this proposed settlement's finalized. Yeah, comp compensation offers can still be made from the seller. This is the big one here to understand that the change is not as dramatic as our feelings might be. Okay, our... Uh, you know, what we're seeing online, we're going to have a, a little segment here at the end of where you should be consuming information so that you get it right and take out the drama. Okay. The, mm -hmm. the agents should be thinking of a no drama zone. It's why I said, Hey, share this video immediately right now, hit the share button on YouTube and share it out to an agent or a broker who needs to see this, hit the thumbs up so we can get this to more people and rise the tides because these compensation offers that are going to come from the seller to the buyer agent are going to bring us to the same place that we've always been. Is there going to be more work in the meantime? CEO of Mosaic said it on my podcast, Sheila Reddy. She said, agents are going to have to do more with less. 
the four hour a week agent probably doesn't have a place to do a lot of business when you think about all the steps in between the buyer presentation, the buyer pitch, and all of the negotiation conversations, transparency, disclosures that you'll be operating with in the new world. Another question you're going to have based off of what we know right now is, well, who pays the buyer agent? Having an answer that's concise and crisp is going to deliver certainty to your clients. Okay. Who pays the buyer agent? Number one, the seller pays the buyer agent. The number two option is the buyer pays the buyer agent. And then the number three option is both the seller and the buyer can pay that buyer agent. Okay. The listing broker does not pay for to the buyer agent. All right. That compensation is gone. But the seller has the right, has the choice, has the strategic position to pay the buyer agent. Starting that response to your buyer clients is going to really be important on if you're going to make have them work with you in the future. Okay. Um, starting with, well, let's see, or I don't know, or th it Things can happen different ways. Uncertainty, uncertainty, uncertainty. When, you, when you're asked the question, who pays the buyer agent? Well, that's easy. Can I walk you through that? Yes, you can. Number one, the seller can pay the buyer agent. Number two, the buyer can pay the buyer agent. Or the number three option is both. Would you like to hear the options that we've put together to make sure that number one becomes a reality for you, right? Um, commentary on this question that's going to be asked, Tom. Yeah, there's going to be a lot. I mean, I think that the first thing you need to look at here is cost transparency. This, this to me is is huge that you need to go to these appointments, right? And let's say you've got someone under a buyer agency agreement at X percent, whatever that says. What if seller one is offering out Y, seller two is offering out Z, right? You don't know what the numbers are going to be. As an agent, Part of your preparation process, you can't just show up and see if they like the house anymore. Like, let's get that very clear. That's what kind of got us into this mess in the first place. That's at least part of it. Showing them, hey, this is what it's going to cost you to buy this home. This is what it's going to cost you to buy house number two. And go through those costs in detail. Now, a lot of them are going to be fixed. Title insurance, transfer tax, mortgage origination costs. The commission is going to be a variable. And then there's the option of, hey, in situation number two, where the seller is not willing to pay as much as house number one, let's negotiate a concession here. Let's make this part of our offer. And the good news that I see here is that, you know, now in the, in the past, when you walked into a home, you knew what the compensation was going to be. And some MLSs, the rule was once you walk in and show the home, you're accepting that compensation. Well, now that this comes off the MLS, there's the ability to negotiate that. So it's not a fixed item. And you can try to get that from the seller as part of your offer. Now, the flip side is if it's a competitive situation, that might negatively affect you. So you've got to walk people through these scenarios and what all the options are, Byron, because if they don't know options, they're not going to have certainty. And certainty doesn't lead to an informed real estate decision, which is the goal of any knowledge broker, anyone that's trying to practice real estate right now. Lisa, what do you got on this? Well, so I was going to add, I think in the just getting super strategic outside of the script of working with the buyer, I think one of the things that agents need to be super aware of is the script of working with listing agents if they're going to be representing buyers. And so backing it up even further, the one thing that I really want to emphasize is that I believe that this is truly a massive opportunity for agents who want to become buyer agent specialists. And I think just like there's agents that are going to be really great with sellers and there are consumers who want to work with experienced listing agents, I think it's a hundred thousand percent imperative that agents understand that consumers do want representation. We've made it this far in the industry with all of the options that have been out there, all of the discount brokerages and everything else where consumers could get commissions rebated to them, yet consumers have still chosen to go with full service agents for a reason. So I definitely want to make it clear that there is an opportunity for agents to come out of this being legit, amazing buyer agents. And what I'll add to that is the opportunity to earn more money as a buyer agent on a move forward than they've been able to historically. 
in the old way, walking in, if that co-broke was offered at 2%, that's what you were getting, no matter your experience level, what you were worth, mm -hmm. or potentially even what you had negotiated or attempted to negotiate with your client up front. Um, I've been seeing the quote floating around from uh, Barbara Corcoran, who said that the days of 5 and 6% contracts are over. And over and over, I keep saying agents saying that's not true. But I actually argue that it is true. We're not going to be writing as many 5 and 6% contracts anymore. But I believe that buyer agents will start writing 3 and 4% contracts where those really strong, skilled, knowledgeable, expert buyer agents will be able to be comped 3 and 4%. That being said, my strategic point to this is understanding that the listing agents on the other side of the table aren't necessarily going to be as skilled as the buyer agents who choose to specialize. And to your point with multiple offer situations, I think some of the stuff that agents need to start thinking about is how do they present those offers where they're roping in uh, buyer agency compensation at some level in a way that the listing agent will be able to adequately explain it to the seller sitting on the other side of the table, especially if they're reviewing five, six, 10 offers all at once and getting down to the net price to the seller. Well, well Lisa, that really demonstrates my point that I think on the other side here, you know, agents have way too uh, often been loose with the numbers, loose with the yep. cost estimates. And, you know, and it's, you know, I've talked to experienced agents saying, Hey, wh why do I even need to provide this? And one, it's the law in Pennsylvania. So that would be my first reason. But you've got, you know, when you present an offer and there's five offers to a seller, it's not just the term sheet anymore. It's the term sheet and the net price. And Correct. then going through what those numbers are. And I'm getting a lot of questions here. How do you how do you deliver certainty without knowing what they what someone will pay? Well, when you have a contract negotiated up front with a buyer, there's certainty there. And then when the offers are presented to the seller, there's certainty. And it's your job to provide the numbers so everyone can understand it. Yeah. The, <clears throat> when walking a buyer through this, um, number one, the seller can pay my fee. That can be negotiated in every single offer that we make. All right. Uh, we can get into the advantage that sellers are going to have, which we will get into. The sellers will have by offering compensation just as they historically have done. The only change is that compensation won't live on the MLS. That compensation is going to be communicated to me, your buyer representation. If there is a home that does not offer compensation, the moment I find out about that, you're going to be alerted of that fact as the buyer. Now we go to number two, where you're going to pay the buyer representation fee for the services that I'm providing you. If we are looking at a house that is offering a zero, we go back to why you hired me, the negotiation to get that zero to the number that you agreed to pay me as your buyer agency rep. We also can have a discussion about what that looks like at that time. It's very simple. Here are the steps that we're going to take through this process <laughs> with clear transparency and cl clear disclosure the entire uh, way forward, all right? Can I just uh, interrupt you real quick, Byron? Yeah. I think one of the things, and it hasn't been spoken about a ton, but when you read the actual proposed settlement, one of the things that it specifies very clearly is that each buyer agency contract needs to have absolute certainty around the amount. It cannot be ambiguous with the amount mm -hmm. that the uh, consumer will be paying. So just be very aware that there is some guidelines about what has to be written into the contract with respect to compensation. Yeah. And, and let's be clear here. This conversation with the buyer um, is a change from what most are practicing right now. Mm -hmm. It definitely requires more consultation, more strategic alignment, more sessions whether it be on Zoom, in person, over the phone with the buyer. It's why I don't believe in the four-hour agent moving forward, the part-time agent you know, moving forward, a part-time agent that has a goal and a vision of selling 30 homes. If you can point me into that direction, love to shake their hand because they're accomplishing something with limited time that I've never seen. I've gotten a lot of flack over the years for – talking about the part-time agent, yet nobody on this live chat would willingly hire 
a part-time surgeon to come in there and operate on their body on their body. Nobody on this chat would go and willingly hire a part-time four hour a week attorney to represent them in the biggest lawsuit of their life. And I just don't see a possibility of where the professional buyer agent who is getting the, the, the fees that are due to their, you know, due to them for their service, able to do that in a short time frame. So I, I think that um, that is unfortunately a systemic issue that NAR and even some brokers have perpetuated throughout the industry where it's a body count business. And the shift here, the change in mentality is going to be uh, that of a professional more than full time. I did a, uh, a little a question and answer on my Instagram and all the agents were saying, you know, 50, 60, 70 hours a week. Don't expect that to change. Okay. That, that's only going to go up. Lisa, you made a point about the options that people already have. As long as I've been in the 2011, 2012 on the sales side, I've always seen the option for consumers to decide to go entry only on the MLS for 500 mm -hmm. bucks or, or whatever. Or even Why think don't... back for sale by owner.com. When I was first getting into the industry, that was a thing. And everyone thought now that consumers don't need to pay anything, they're just going to list for sale by owner.com and guarantee you nobody even knows what that website is today when they're thinking about selling their home. Unrepresented a great lead generation pillar, at least you just go and call the for sale by owners and get listing appointments with them. Like I did. Unrepresented forms have been available throughout, but why has the, the model of the buyer's agent compensation worked? Why has it worked for so many of these transactions? Because consumers are hungry for your service. They want that. Okay. So the change of how the compensation is delivered at closing is different. How that message is relayed, not in the MLS, outside the MLS is different. The place you end up is ultimately the same. Okay. And, and consumers are going to continue to choose that option just as they always have. Um, sellers, uh, they, the, when the seller pays the buyer agent, why will this continue? Because it's a competitive advantage for them. For mm -hmm. the sellers who choose this option to sell their home, to list, to market, when they negotiate with their listing broker and this part of the conversation comes up, they are going to understand as they always have the ones, the segment of the market, which is a large segment, it's a juicy segment of sellers who decide I want to negotiate this in upfront, that's going to be a large population of sellers who decide that I want the competitive advantage in the market of taking this conversation off the table. Because number two, it eliminates a potential, potential negotiation hurdle. Does a seller want to negotiate every commission on every offer spend potentially one or two days in that negotiation time frame, risking that the buyer, while they're negotiating their buyer agent's commission and not focused on the home purchase, is now in a 48 hour period going to see other opportunities, other competition, competing homes coming online uh, that are potentially gonna just get cold feet, that are gonna get exhausted in this first negotiation because they don't negotiate every single day. And they haven't even gotten to the house negotiation. Remember, the buyer wants the house. Uh, the seller wants to sell the house. Okay, they want to find this buyer. So they get exhausted in this negotiation because it hasn't been clearly identified up front. You're going to lose a lot of buyers that way. The sellers are. So sellers are overwhelmingly going to choose this competitive advantage. Are there, Lisa, going to be um, listing brokers that come up with a model or, or listing agents that come up with a model that offer a zero to buyer agents. Yeah, just as there always has been. Okay, there's going to be that model. It's going to exist. It did yesterday and it will tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's the competitive nature of the business. It's, it's what the majority of the consumers are going to decide is best for them. That's how we're going to be moving forward in this. Absolutely, 100%. And I... It, 
go back to, we're seeing them pop up already. And it's it's interesting to see the reactions that agents have. There's one that popped up in New Hampshire that's offering menu of services on the listing side and 0% co-broke on the buy side. And it was a, a big chat discussion in my office the other day. And I said, it's existed all along. It's just that right now it's a little bit more front and center, partly because of all the media attention that's getting. And it's going to die down just like it always has in the past. I can go through the number of brokerages that have offered, tried to offer the model year over year. You think about Redfin, right, which was born by offering rebates of the commission to yep. the buyer and they did away with it. I can think of Zip Realty was another one that did the exact same thing, right? We could go through the list. I, I think of, I can probably come up with three to five brokerages that were built on the model of giving a portion of the commission back to the consumer. And every single one of those is no longer, either they're no longer in business or they no longer have that business model. Can The consumer speaks loudly. They want professional representation when purchasing their largest asset. A couple things that I didn't put in here for what we know right now, even though it's in the settlement proposal, I see a, co a couple of comments about this. Um, one of them being, why, why can't the agents advertise their commission? Well, in the settlement, there's yes. a spot that says, hey, brokers can put it on their own website. Right Now, there's there's a gray area of what that's going to look like. Okay, so we don't know exactly how that's going to shake out, but the, agree, you know, the agreed settlement or the proposal... Um, does state that. Also, I, I'm seeing a lot of things. Well, my state doesn't do this. Uh, one thing I can also say that we know, I could have put it in number six here for certainty, all your forms are going to change between now and, and middle of July. Okay. So understand that this is version one. These are the activities I'd be doing right now. Uh, in my team, we've, we've already implemented having a buyer disclosure, agency disclosure form, and buyer right to rep form signed before showings, okay? That we know we can do right now. We can rip that part of the Band-Aid off right now. It, this is version one. Over the next two, three months, I'm collecting data. I remember during March of 2020, when the world fell apart, what did I do for three months? I cut every single expense, I collected data, and then I moved in June or July when I knew I had a winning hand I went all in on what the actions were that I would need to take because it became clear and obvious. Come July of this year, the winning hand is going to become obvious. Mm -hmm. And those of us who are paying attention, getting their education in the right place, are going to push all of our chips in the middle and go all in on that moment. And many of us, I, I believe everybody here on this stream, is going to win in such a significant way. I went on from 2020 till today to sell more homes in my state than any other team could even think of doing because I saw the winning hand. It was clear went all in. There's going to be a winning ha hand here and, it, and it's going to be easy to implement and go all in on. Um, so seller pays the buyer agent. It's going to give them a competitive advantage. When you understand that, when you say, okay, that competitive agent, uh, competitive advantage for sellers still exists that should bring a calm over the change that is coming. Uh, it's more than okay right now to be a buyer's agent. I think we, we need start. to add the words kick ass in there. I, right. it's, I, I think it, you've Can we got, edit the slide? <laughs> please edit my slide. Uh, and I think that that's something that's super important for agents to embrace. I love the mentality, and this is a Tom Tool expression, that it's list to last. And I believe that. But I do also believe that as an industry, we have to all be okay saying, I am going to be the best buyer agent that's out there. I can't, this is what I'm going to be screaming from the rooftops because there is going to be a way to make it a very profitable business from the buy side. But to your point, Byron, I think agents have to be ready to adapt and change. And I think just like when COVID shook out, I remember 2020. One of the big things that we would do is in our leadership meetings, we would talk about plan A, plan B, and plan C, and we would be trying a little bit of all three, but very quickly recognize which one was the winner. And then, like you said, all chips into the middle on the one of the three to five options that was proving to be the most powerful and the most impactful to keep things going. Uh, will this re be recorded? Yes, this is going to be recorded. If you signed up for it, you'll, you'll get a replay. Um, the, or the replay will live inside of BAMX. You can use code MADNESS to get 20% off of BAMX, of course. 
Um, the slides are going to be delivered to everybody. There's going to be a link for the slides. So you're going to get all of that. Getting this information out to as many agents to rise the tide is super important. Like the video, subscribe to this channel. When, when news breaks, we bring it here immediately. Um, while you know some folks were trying to internalize what was going on, uh, we put out a video Friday and reacted in real time. 15,000 uh, views on that video. So subscribe to this channel and, um, and, and make sure you're following along. I agree with Lisa here. Buyer Can I agents add are, are going to have a huge place. Go ahead. Yeah. One more thing. I, and I think one of the things that I keep seeing in the chat here is the question of why will buyers pay for a buyer agent? Well, so let me just be very clear that buyers will not pay for the door opener that has existed from 2020 to 2024. And I do believe Every single agent who's going to represent buyers needs to get very, very clear about their value proposition. And it isn't just finding homes on the MLS. It isn't just opening doors. It's not just writing offers. And I think that this is where agents need to be very clear. And part of becoming a specialist is also becoming a hunter. It's helping your buyers find opportunities that they're not going to find on their own in MLS. I actually kind of agree. If your value is I'm going to be the one that's going to show up, that's going to open the door and that's going to draft the paperwork for you, there's no chance that buyers are going to pay a premium for that service. But if you're the agent who can conduct a killer buyer consult, understand what that buyer is looking for, their goals, their motivation and their timeline. If you can help them find the property that they're not going to be able to find on their own, if you're going to be able to get help them get the price and terms that is going to make them feel confident and comfortable in the transaction, buyers will pay for that, but they will not pay for the door opener. We're going to have Cristianos joining us in just a bit as we work through these slides. We're also going to have a BAM X after party for a whole bunch of uh, question and answer. Uh, you can get into BAM X use code madness all month of March madness to get 20% off of BAM X and join us there. A uh, buyer pays the buyer agent. Okay. This is going to be something that's clearly outlined in the buyer representation form that, that buyer agent that Lisa just described, that isn't a door opening agent that has clearly outlined. If you were to go through your day here over the next week and in your notes app, just continue to write down everything that you do for the buyers, create that list as part of your buyer presentation, continue to add to it. I saw one in BMX, um, I think it was today, that had over 80 roles that the buyer agent is doing and conducting right now. Create your own list that is reminiscent of what you do and, and is uh, you know curated for your market. The list should be long, it should be lengthy. Mm -hmm. There's so many different things. I think on average, when we look in, in uh, our CRM, you know, how many text messages does it take to get from meeting a buyer to the closing table? It's around 500 text messages. There's an abundance of work that buyer agents provide that buyers do not want any part of, that buyers don't have the skill set to do because they buy a house one every seven to 12 years. Clearly outlining how you will get paid as that professional buyer agent is going to live in that buyer representation form. And buyers are going to be presented with a variety of options, either from you or somebody else. What is your menu of compensation models going to look like? I know, Lisa, you had some thoughts on uh, a menu of comp models. <clears throat> yeah. And well, and so what I'll say is a kind of two things. My thought process through all of this is that we need to re-envision the buy side stuff to look like the list side stuff. And so the days, my suspicion, here's one of my suspicions, there was an industry stat that I think it's like 70% of buyers would work with the first agent that they met face to face. I think that that number is going to change drastically. And I think that we're going to find buyers who start interviewing buyer agents the same way that sellers interview listing agents. Mm -hmm. I think Buyers need to start reimagining what their value proposition is outside of just finding homes, opening doors, everything that else that I've just said, and start looking at it from the perspective of how have we helped sellers? Is there an equivalent to staging and photographs and all of the things that agents bring to the table for sellers that can be brought to the table for buyers? Is it something like an attorney who is available at 
you know, Monday through Friday, nine to five to answer any questions via emails and text messages that is facilitated by the agent? Is it access to professionals who can provide consultations about inspections or repairs? Is it what is it that are the services that buyers are going to look for that kind of equate out to the services that a seller looks for when selecting a listing agent? I think when looking at options for buyer agency contracts, I think we're going to see each agent choosing models that are going to work for them. Some may choose to continue to work in a very traditional model where they're going to charge a percentage of the purchase price, whether it's 1%, 2%, all the way up to 4% or more, who knows. I think we'll see some agents come out and say, I'm just going to do it for a flat fee, $5,000, $10,000, $20,000, whatever that looks like. And I think we're going to see even other agents come out with a model that says, I'm going to charge you by service. I'm going to charge you per showing, per inspection, per number of comparative market analysis that I prepare. I'm going to charge you by the hour for driving or for market research. Um, and I think it's just super important that each agent pick the model or the models that are going to best suit them and the clients that they choose to serve. Their, your price point's going to be dependent on that. Your market's going to be dependent on that. You know, you're going to be able to curate that experience um, better than anybody in your market because you know your market. But remember, this part here, the competitive advantage that sellers have yep. is going to happen a whole heck of a lot more where they are, the seller is deciding to compensate the buyer agent. Okay. It's going to happen a whole heck of a lot more than this model understand that that is a advantage for the seller when that clear advantage is articulated to them you will see what we've always seen you just won't see it in your mls that field will be gone but the practice of being compensated by the seller is going to exist moving forward are there going to be a variety of other options should you know them inside and out Absolutely, you should. There's not going to be many. Listen, there's not going to be many listing uh, brokers that decide that they're going to work 20 offers with 20 different buyers all of a sudden for free. That, that, that model is not going to be in abundance, that they're not going to charge, that they're not going to have to staff up. It's not going to take too many really bad reviews on mm -hmm. that model for sellers to decide uh, I'm going to have a, a huge burden here on one person as opposed to negotiating this up front. L Lisa, do you have a thought on that? I do. I, well, so the other part of it, I believe that's going to come into play is it, there might be, again, just like anything, a shakeout where yes, maybe buyers do go direct to listing agents. I see that a lot in the comments here. But to your point, what I'd toss back is, I also think that once buyers realize how can a listing agent draft offers and give advice to five different consumers who are all putting in an offer on that same property, that's issue one with that statement. Issue two is that it's not going to take long for the horror stories of dual agency to stop, start popping up where consumers feel like they weren't given the advice and the knowledge that they would have had if they had a buyer agent and something catastrophic came up in the home, a bad foundation, a, a major repair that they didn't expect, lost deposits because the fiduciary responsibility of the listing agent is to the seller and is never to the buyer. And I think once those horror stars start proliferating, once the errors and omissions claims start increasing, I think it will swing the pendulum back to helping buyers understand, again, the importance of, I'm going to say this over and over, a highly skilled, highly effective, highly knowledgeable buyer's agent. Yeah, I'm, and I'm in agreement with that. I probably just didn't articulate it as well as Lisa. There's three contracts uh, that include a compensation discussion and fees. That's that listing contract. Again, there's going to be a discussion more times than not about the clear competitive advantage sellers are going to have by knocking out the buyer compensation uh, offering when they list. Okay. The buyer contract goes over and we, we did it, how that buyer agency is paid. And remember, just as there always has been that purchase contract identifies other compensation to be paid. Are you using a loan? There's compensation there. Are you using a title rep? Of course, you're using that or an attorney. 
there's other compensation there. So breaking down the three buckets to your clients helps them understand that there are different points in the transaction where compensation needs to come up uh, and, and be discussed. Let me jump in about these contracts because I've been talking with our attorneys about this. And we, unfortunately, we are in a culture where a lot of agents, their review of the contract is, hey, I'm going to send it over to you, sign it. And there is no explanation of what these terms mean, right? What it says in each section. And if you're not practicing this, this has got to be to a point where you can explain each paragraph in a sentence or two max and walk people through what goes on. Because a lot of agents, I mean, how many times have you two been in, a, in, a, in an agreement? and the agent doesn't even know what happens when, like, if X, then Y, right? It's very clear in the agreement of sale and other, other contracts here. You've got to know these contracts backwards and forwards because if you don't and you have to get one signed before showing a house or you screw up filling it out, what do you think is going to happen? They're not going to work with you. Whether you're on the buyer side, you're on the listing side, it's coming time for a purchase. And the more time it takes for you to get under contract with these people, time's going to kill deals here. Byron, you talked about the competitive advantage for sellers. If it's taken two or three days to negotiate compensation and you don't know how that works, well, it, like you said, cold feet happen. People will pull out of transactions. So the contract knowledge here is often overlooked. And it's something that someone who really is committed to the listing side or the buyer side is going to know how to explain each and every one of them flawlessly on demand right in front of people. Sellers want buyers, buyers want homes. And as much red tape as you can eliminate between those two coming together, uh, you're going to win. And eliminating red tape is going to mean that a compensation model that has worked um, is likely to continue in such a big way. Uh, I think it's going to blow a lot of people's minds out there. Media opportunities right now. Okay. Transaction abundance, open house expertise and experience, build in a service model and create a buyer presentation. These are things that we know right now we can start today. There are going to be other data points that come out in the next two to three months that are going to make this list longer. But the transaction abundance is something that has been around since the 80s, as far back as this data is available. If you look from the early 90s to today, 4 million trend existing home sales. This doesn't even include new home sales. 4 million or more existing home sale transactions have happened each and every single year. Okay, so this is going to be ho hopefully helpful for a mindset uh, for an agent who is freaking out a little bit. There, there isn't a need to freak out. The abundance of opportunity ahead of us. And we're back at that 4 million mark, which means it's going to go back up to the five because we've seen that enough since the early 90s, where 5 million existing home sales is more of the median than 4 million. 4 million happened now and it happened uh, during the great financial crisis. Transactions are going up in the next 24 months. Those who are willing to do this work, there's a debate. Are agents going up or down? The opportunities are right in front of you. If you need 30 transactions to get to your goals, to, to get the life that you want, to take care of your family, to make the income, to build the wealth that you want. If you need 40 transactions, if you need 50, those are the people that you need to focus on. The 30 or 40 or 50 in the next 12 months that you can help serve, that the, what you provide to a buyer client, to a listing client is what they're seeking. Make your offering around that. You're looking for 30, 40, 50 out of 8 million sides. The, the abundance is out there. Open well, houses. At, Go ahead, Tom. If you want to talk on abundance no, real quick. Well, abundance. Yeah. I mean, I, I, what, what I'm going to say is like, we, we, you look what COVID did, right? I think there's a lot of people during COVID that kind of ran away or they stuck their head in the ground. And then the people that worked during that 60 day period, much shorter, they thrived right afterwards. Right. In 2008, we went through a financial crisis. Uh, I mean, I was, I, I got engaged like right before GM failed and I'm selling real estate. I'm like, this is a, this is a good decision. What's going on? But I kept my head down and worked. And then after the market rebounded in 2012, you saw a lot of fruits of your labor during that time. So this is not the time to run away or to stick your head in the ground. You want to go right at this here with, here's the changes I can make today with version 1.0. Here's the actions I can take. Here's what I need to look for and keep working because motivation is still going to matter here. There's people out there, they're buying a house this year whether or not they have a buyer agent, no matter what the NAR settlement is, 
motivation matters in times like this when there's some uncertainty or transition in the real estate business because people don't care about the agent. They care about their own needs when it comes to a home. And fundamentally, like you can listen to all this noise here and all this stuff, and it's right to be on here getting educated. Don't let this take the focus away from the day-to-day -day things in your business that are going to bring you income. So uh, critical right now. Nathan from Alabama and South Carolina. Can someone clear this up for me? Do you have to have a signed agreement before showing a home or giving advice? Big difference. You need to have a signed buyer agreement before touring a home. That in the proposed settlement is going to take place somewhere in mid-July as you know, common practice. The giving advice you will not need to have a signed agreement to give advice. Open houses. Here's an opportunity um, that obviously Dude. has been around forever. And my advice would be to do it as often as you possibly can every single week. Mix in weekdays, mix in weekends, forever and always in your business. Um, why? Because there's no buyer rep form needed to meet people face to face in a home when you're conducting an open house. Okay, so this is a huge opportunity to meet people face to face who have interest in buying and oh, by the way, selling. We know how many sellers attend open houses. And at your open house, are you thinking about creative ways in your open house to have a next step? Okay, uh, sign up for this download. I have an iPad set up here where you can get all of the steps on buying here in my community. I have this event. I have um, somebody working the open house along with me, signing you up for education material that we provide for free for buyers. What is the next step aside from touring the home that they can take with you to educate themselves? Being creative in how you conduct the open houses. I know baked cookies are creative and delicious and all of that, but what is the next step that elevates you from all the other open houses in a way that a buyer is like, when I'm ready, I'm, I'm going to go back to that person for a consultation because they were clearly above the rest. Not well, cookies. Yeah. not Yeah. If I need a baker, I'll go to the baker. I mean, what, what are we doing here? But uh, with open houses, right? Your follow is going to matter there. I mean, what are you doing afterwards? Are you sending personalized videos? Are you reaching out to the people? Are you thanking them? Are you bringing other options of other homes you could show them that aren't open that weekend. Like this is sales 101. It's bringing options to people that meet their needs. And, you know, we've all heard this stuff, Lisa and Byron. Byron, I know you've got a great open house sign in script that you've shared. If you're not taking the step, like people have heard this stuff forever, you actually have to do it now. And it's, and like you said, it's your one chance to meet them in person without having an agreement signed in the house and the product you're selling. Massive opportunity. Build a service model into your buy side. When Lisa's talking about, um, it's going to be more than okay to be a kick-ass buyer agent. What what are the things you're going to do that live beyond the transaction, that live beyond the normal nature of connecting a buyer into a home? Okay, I mentioned before, list everything that you do now and then start running a list number two. What can you add to that service? Can you add a moving truck? Can, can you add access to vendors in a quick and easy way? Are you willing to be the conduit between a buyer and the vendor? Are you willing to help uh, create those quotes and those opportunities for them? Every single buyer needs something when they move in a home. Are you giving them a bottle of champagne that they can crack and start thinking about that long list that they're doing? Or are you helping create the list with them? Not only help create the list, but acting on the list. This service model buyer agent uh, might just very well raise their fees that they've been used uh, to collecting. So be and thinking beyond the, the finding of a home. Go ahead, Lisa. I think beyond the transaction of buying a home, I'm going to like argue that agents should be thinking about what does it look like to offer that buyer service for six to 12 months after the transaction is completed? To your point, the moving trucks and some of the other things, but are there resources and tools and uh, expertise that agents can offer post closing? So the days of saying past clients, which has always been a pet peeve of all the three of us truly come to an end. Yeah. Um, 
creating them as creating that language around clients is a big deal. Create a buyer presentation. It needs to be as good or better than your listing presentation. Um, buyer net sheets. You're going to hear this a lot. Uh, I'd, I'd imagine that there's a large percent that don't operate on a buyer net sheet. They're a must. They are a must be because going through the options of how these closing costs work. And then once you have those two things in place, your listing presentation, your buyer net sheet, Practice this as if you're Kobe Bryant. Go Mamba style on your training and your practice. We're about to bring Cristianos up here in just a second um, to talk about how we can accept training as an agent. Where should we be getting the training? How should we be implementing our training? Uh, remember, there's a difference between there's a difference between like a Kobe Bryant and the rest of the players in the NBA. And when you get to the final product, okay, when you get to the closing, the floor, the game, okay, and it all leads up to what he was doing in preparation for that moment. When you are practicing your listing presentation or your buyer presentation over and over and over again, when you're tweaking it, making it better, when you're spending the time investing in it each and every single day, when you get those opportunities, you're going to shine. It's going to be no doubt that you're the agent of choice to move forward with. And Tom said, talking about the buyer present, like when you meet them on that first home tour, it's game time now. It is time to lace up and shine in such a significant way that you make that lasting impact. Anything on uh, the, the presentation here, Tom? You know, proper preparation prevents poor performance. And if you're not practicing this, we, we had this conversation with our team. And if let's say you're going to rate your presentation one to five. I'm, I'm a big believer you can never get to like a five or a 10, right? If you're not at a four and you're expecting buyers to sign a contract with you, you better start practicing. Three is not going to get it done. Two certainly isn't going to get it done. Uh, and, and you talk about, you know, Kobe Bryant. Well, that guy practiced relentlessly when people were sleeping. Right. I mean, there's that classic Team USA story and you're talking about the listing presentation. You've got to have a clear way to differentiate yourself. I'm a big believer in, hey, most agents have a three point plan. Then you tell them the three points and you go into everything that you do. It's an easy way for consumers to understand that every single day is going to be an interview. Byron, we've talked about this on our accountability calls. Think about you're at the open house, right? Are you there on time? Are the signs up properly? Are you greeting people professionally because you've got potential sellers coming in? And now that's a major buyer interview, which your one chance to do that instead of giving them the show one house model that a lot of people use to try to win on personality instead of tactical professional service. There is a major difference there when it comes time to sign a contract. Looking at a home can be fun for a lot of people and they go do that. And it's, it's something that's fun when you're signing a contract before you go there, people are thinking twice and that's, how you have to approach every presentation. This is a job interview for a huge financial transaction. And if you're not going in with that mindset, someone else is, and you're going to get beat. Ryan Judson uh, moved to move in San Diego, uh, commenting about the commercial model. This is another, you know, we made the points that sellers are going to have a clear advantage to, to negotiating a buyer agent compensation up front, many, many sellers, my opinion would be majority of are going to choose that model when they sit down to list their home. Uh, you know, a, a point that Ryan's making in the comments and a point that should also bring ease to any anxiety you have is that this model works in commercial. Little, Obviously, yes. everything's a little bit different, but why do commercial sellers um, who might be, you know, let's, let's, if you've ever done commercial, the commercial seller is typically, um, a little grumpy. They're, they're, they're not the, uh, the most pleasant, uh, folks uh, out there to work with, like somebody with an enjoyment and fulfillment of buying a home or selling a home might be right. Um, uh, why do commercial sellers overwhelmingly choose the model to negotiate the buyer agent compensation in to the purchase agreement into the LOI into, into whatever? because it's the best path forward for them to increase their opportunities of getting what they ultimately want, which is a net price on the sale. It's why they choose to do that overwhelmingly. Um, supply and demand. Obviously, uh, we understand supply and demand in the economics of housing. Okay, what's the supply of homes on the market? 
and what's the demand? How many buyers are there for those homes? Uh, we know that supply on homes has been really low. Okay, buyer uh, demand has actually been lower this year than last year. Yet there's such a shortage of the supply of homes in many of your markets. Home prices have been going up. Okay, when there's an abundance of home supply, for those of us that have been in markets where uh, there's more than six months inventory of supply. By the way, th those markets are coming back. Um, you know, the, the west coast of Florida is experiencing it right now. When there's more supply in a marketplace, okay, then the buyers have a little bit more leverage. Your offerings, the offerings that are out there, there's going to be a supply of a certain amount of offerings that agents and brokerages make to clients, okay? And the demand from the from our clients is going to be what are what are they seeking for a service? Okay, what do they want in their agent? The better services that you produce, that you supply, uh, the more you're going to be able to meet the moment and stand out from all of the other offerings. Just like a well kept after home stands above and beyond the competition. Uh, in 2011, 2012, when when my market, Connecticut, bottomed out, uh, there you know the market completely bottomed out, and in some price points there was 30 months of inventory. There was always homes that sold. If you think about that analogy, there's always going to be agents that are helping guide buyers and sellers that are signing buyer contracts and listing contracts. It's going to come down. The homes that sold in that market when there was 30 months of inventory were the ones that had all their ducks in a row, had obviously pride of ownership and presented themselves in the best fashion, the best price and all of that. It's a really easy way to think about the future. Now, where should you get your info? There's six places. Get into BAMX immediately. If you check out right now and use code MADNESS, M-A-D-N-E-S-S, -S, you're going to get 20% off of BAMX. Um, we're not going to stop here. We're going to continue to take the best educational materials and training and information that you need each and every single week. I know we've got a bunch of BAMX members in here. We're going to do a BAMX after party on question and answer. So if you sign up for BAMX now, go add yourself to the BAMX Facebook group. It'll be in an email. Uh, so you can get the Zoom link for the after party. Okay, so join BAMX, use code 20% off. I'm gonna be doing a, ba uh, a BAMX after party once we bring up Chris, talk to him, then we're gonna jump into there. Um, Knowledge Brokers Podcast, sign up for the podcast. It's a different channel. I see some, um, there's, there's a few of you watching. There's over 2,000 here on the BAM channel obviously subscribe to this one if you're on it over 2000 you've been watching here we also have a at knowledge brokers podcast channel where myself tom and lisa do this each and every single week hit that qr code and subscribe to knowledge brokers podcast sharon travazza's video that he put out earlier this week president of real brokerage one of the best videos that you can consume and should consume uh, the tom ferry jack miller video that comes out tomorrow uh, we're going to put a link in here for that as well. Go and sign up for that. Jack Miller talks to more of the um, brokers around the country than almost anybody in our industry. Tom's going to be breaking down steps moving forward. Get your information from there. Know your state laws. As these laws change, I know many my state doesn't allow this. My state, every state's going to make adjustments between now and mid July. Know those state laws inside and out. And then your local leader, who are you affiliated with? Uh, I said on a recent Knowledge Brokers podcast that if you're signing a three-year agreement uh, right now, you're insane. Uh, I'm sorry. And uh, unfortunately, if you signed one yesterday, my apologies, but I want to be able to align myself with the local leader, the team leader, the brokerage, the managing broker, uh, the, the right brokerage that's going to put me in the best position to succeed in this new market, in this new environment. Who has the best forms? Okay, who's taken the new form uh, from the state laws that I need to, and put it in a position uh, to be a marketing asset for me? Uh, understand who your local leaders are that are doing a great job implementing those, innovating on the opportunities, and also who have the best training for you to be the most successful. And with that, I wanna bring up Chris Gianos, um, who is someone who's built 
one of the largest teams in the U.S. Uh, he spent time at Zillow. Okay, he's built a leading brokerage in the U.S. He's now the CEO of Humanize, a recruiting and training company, helping team leaders and, and brokers across the country find great agents like the ones listening here. Chris, one, how should we be accepting training? How should we get ready for the moment to increase the training required to be the agent of choice? And then two, how should we be implementing the training? And thank you, Cristiano, for joining us. Absolutely, Byron. Thanks for having me. He, here's the one thing I want to say. I've been listening intently this entire time and kind of keeping tabs on the chat. There's a quote that comes to mind that I want to get everyone kind of focused on before I answer that question. I, I saw it recently on Twitter. Uh, I don't remember exactly who said it, but it was, when it comes to happiness in times of change, what's going to keep you happier? And I'm not talking about who's going to be more successful or who's going to have a better outcome, but is it better to be optimistic and wrong than it is to be pessimistic and right? Right. And what I mean by that is we're going into a time of, of wild change in this industry. And I think the people that are going to win are going to be the people that come into this ready to put their head down and work, but more importantly, with the right attitude. Right. I think that as we see these changes kind of unfold, this is version one, like Byron was talking about. It's probably going to change 10 times. The work we do now, we're probably going to have to scrap and do all over again in a couple of months when this actually happens. Right. But I can promise you, if you're a top producing badass agent that is going to kind of embrace this thing with change and with grace intact, doing it with a pissed off attitude and angry at the world is not going to do anything. And I'm probably going to get some flack for saying that. But like in times of change like this, you got to keep your head on straight, regardless of how hectic it gets. Because if you don't, I promise you that your customers and anyone that you're interacting with will feel it, which puts you in a shitty place to begin with anyways. Does that make sense? Yeah, Tom, you had a Sharon quote about defend, not don't defend. It's from that that video that I mentioned there. Yeah, it, it, you don't want to defend. You want to educate, right? I mean, it, it, this is nobody's fault here. I mean, there may be fingers to point, sure, but you can't let that affect your business because, yeah. I mean, Chris, you talk about a negative attitude, right? You can pick that negative, ad, negative attitude up miles away. So when you start defending, uh -huh. well, this is wrong, this is wrong. Well, guess what? I'm looking for the person that says, hey, here's how I'm going to help you buy or sell a house right now. And the you make it all about that. They, they yeah. don't care. You're right. The consumer doesn't care. And here's the other thing I would think about, Byron, to answer the rest of your question. Like I, I've seen in the chat too, I think when change happens like this, it's really easy for us to all get fired up. I'm an agent. I've been a team leader. I've been in all these different roles. So I understand it. The like age of entitlement is gone, right? Mm -hmm. I saw some comments in there of, I'm not going to talk to a buyer unless they do this or jump through this hoop or do this. That's okay. If you won't, someone else will. Right. And I know that sounds harsh again, but like the entitlement isn't going to win in this new world. The person who's going to win is who's the most knowledgeable and capable at articulating a really, really badass value prop. That's who's going to win. Right. Lisa and I were talking about this this morning and bucketed into like three groups. Lisa, I'm totally going to rip off your, your <laughs> coin here. So I'll give you credit for it. But Lisa and I were chatting this morning in, in advance of this. The way she sees it and the way I agreed with her is there's going to be really three buckets of people in the next couple of months, right? There's going to be the innovators. And I see these people as intrinsically optimistic, right? They're going, all right, cool. Shit kind of hit the fan a little bit. I got to adapt and I got to change in my business a little bit. They're going to take immediate action. Now, if you know anything about the psychology of sales or when you're reconstructing a pitch, I would challenge a lot of you guys to think about it this way. You probably have a way that you've done this for the last 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Implementing change is not going to be the easiest thing on the planet because if you're anything like me, I could walk into a listing presentation with my eyes closed and give the same pitch every time because I had it down like that. When you're going to start making changes, there's going to be a learning curve and that's okay, right? There's going to be a time where you're not going to be that super experienced seasoned vet going into an appointment because you're doing something different. I'm experiencing this right now in my own business right? Learning how to like repitch humanize as we add features and stuff, right? So there's going to be the people that bite the bullet now, start making changes to what they're doing and getting in front of it. Short term, what's that going to do? You're probably going to botch a couple appointments, right? Whether it's with a seller or whether it's a buyer talking about buyer agency, you're probably going to screw up a couple appointments. And guess what? I was a new agent. I did that a whole bunch. You're going to make changes. It's going to happen. It's inevitable. Those people in like three to six months are going to be light years ahead of the curve. Byron was talking about in 2020 when like 
he took data in for three to four months and then like pushed all the chips to the center of the table. Those people that start making those changes now to their both their buyer presentations, buyer consultations, and listing presentations, because both of them are going to change, are in, when everyone else starts to feel this, are going to be light years ahead of everybody else in three to six months, right? The next group of these people are going to be the adapters I've named them, right? These are the people that kind of stay neutral. They just implement just enough. Lisa, I named these avatars if you can't tell. I got it. I love right? it. So these people that stay neutral, right, and do just enough to make change, right? They do just enough to get by. They do the mandatory forms. They're going to be okay temporarily. I think at scale, though, in six to 12 months when this thing really turns over, we'll start to see those people kind of not fade to darkness, but probably not be doing as well as they once were, right? Purely because they didn't make the big changes. Then you're going to have these non-responders. These people are, are inherently pessimistic. These are the people who are going to go, I don't like this. That's okay. I promise you that burying your head in the sand is not a business strategy, at least that I would recommend to my friends or colleagues, right? This is not going to go away, right? It's probably going to change two, three, four, five times over the course of the next 12 months. But resisting change is not a business strategy. The only constant we really have is, is change, right? And we've been really fortunate for the last long time that our industry really hasn't experienced much of it outside market conditions and cycles. Now we've got some fundamental stuff that's changing in our business. If you resist it, that's okay. This is going to sound harsh, but realistically, th this might not be for you anymore, right? Purely because it's going to be that dramatic and it's, it's going to be that dramatic in six to 12 months. So I, I see a lot of comments in the chat. Optimism will win. I'm not saying blind optimism in the face of adversity like this. I'm just saying go into it and lean into the change with the right attitude and watch how it works. Like good things will happen in your business. Does that answer your question, Byron? It absolutely does. I mean, definitely from a, from a mindset um, perspective. Yeah. In it, listen, a agents are are going to have um, have this thought probably run through their head. It's like, okay, I get it. Um, you know, I'm already a full time agent. I already have a huge, you know, uh, you know, a huge schedule in front of me each and every single week. I've got a family. I've got kids. There's a lot that I'm already juggling sure. and now I'm going to juggle more. What are some efficiencies that agents um, can start to implement or ways you can think about your schedule? If we're going to get really tactical and think about how can we handle not only the change, but the training and preparation required to meet the opportunity so that our, our optimism, as you would put it, you know, actually works. We follow yeah. through on that optimism with real tactical change, how can we format our schedule? How can we format how much time we should be training? How much time should we be working on the business while we have clients we're serving right now? Yeah. So I would get really intentional with, if I was a solo agent right now, I guess the answer is different for agent, team leader, broker, right? If I was a solo agent right now, to Byron's point, I would first and foremost, make sure that I'm aligned somewhere in some way, shape or form. I don't care which brokerage or team it's at. Just make sure that your leaders and people that you're like getting coaching from are actually leaning into this stuff, right? I got a lot of phone calls this last week to the same point that Byron was talking about from people that I used to work with or people in the industry going, hey, Chris, my broker or my office manager is not really talking about this stuff. What do I do, right? I would first and foremost, make sure that you're aligned with somewhere that's getting in front of this in some way, shape or form, right? Because again, it's not going away. The second thing I would do you got to basically update two things, right? Your buyer consultation and your seller presentation. Those are the two things that are going to need updating in some way, shape or form. Cause there's things changing with both of those things. There's going to be so many intricacies and nuances for each individual market that I don't think there's a broad stroke approach that I could say, Hey, here's what I would do to Byron's point, getting really tactical with all of the value that you provide both buyers and on this list side, getting that clearly articulated somewhere and out in the open that's going to be the framework and the basis for actually creating your presentation. What I would get really, really ridiculously intentional about right now is two things. When you're trying to implement change in your business, most of us, for the most part, don't really have a, hey, someone we're accountable to for the most part. The traditional brokerage model, if you're on a team, it might look a little different. If you're on a traditional brokerage model, you maybe have an office manager, but for the most part, you're like a lone wolf, right? You're doing your own thing. Staying accountable to yourself is sometimes hard. That's why coaches exist, right? I have a coach. I work with a coach. They hold me accountable. It's awesome. 
Setting up some sort of if not now, then when deadline for yourself, I think is going to be super important. And what I mean by that is we could talk all day about updating our buyer and seller presentations and practicing it, doing X, Y, and Z. If I were an agent right now, I would spell it out black and white by a specific date. I'm going to have this thing shipped and in practice, right? And what I mean by that is set a goal for yourself. I don't know how long it's going to take you to do this. Some people are inherently better with scripts than others, right? I'm sure there's all sorts of badass content on BAMX that you can rip off and duplicate or R&D, right? But get in there and get tactical with it. Uh, an activity that I always found that worked really well for me when I was updating my scripts, and I literally just did this with our sales team. When you look at someone else's buyer consultation, for example, you could go on Google right now and type that in, buyer consultation script, and there'd be hundreds of them, right? All sorts of them. Tom's got one. I'm sure Sharon's got one. There's tons of stuff on there. That's written in Tom Ferry, or it's written in Sharon, right? You don't have to reinvent the wheel here. If you're going to take that and make it your own, what I would encourage you to do is an activity that the first person I ever worked for at Zillow made me do. I was 19 years old. I was reading this script after training the first day I got on the phone. I'd made like a hundred phone calls. I probably called some of you on this phone call right now, right? And told me to kick rocks. Wasn't coming out of my mouth good. I sounded like a robot. This guy, John, I worked for told me, hey, go home and write that script out by hand and then practice it, right? With either yourself or your dog or your girlfriend, whoever. Not type it out, write it out with a pen and piece of paper. I did that. And guess what? The next day it came in and it worked like magic. So what I would do if I was an agent right now is I'd get really intentional with by when are you going to ship this and start practicing it, right? And I mean, practicing both in the role-playing sense, whether it's someone on this call or whatever it may be, or actually putting it into practice and implement it in the real world. Again, give yourself the opportunity to screw up a little bit. Do you want to screw up where there's still room and gray area where you don't have to have a buyer broker agreement signed to show every house? Or do you want to start practicing those skill sets when it's game time? right? The less you sweat, what is it? The more you sweat and practice, the less you bleed in battle. That's more relevant now than ever. So I would give yourself a deadline and I would stick to it. I would put it in your calendar. I would tell someone, you know, like, and trust or love about it, right? A spouse, a brother, a sister, dad, mom, dog, cousin, it doesn't matter. Tell them when and when you're going to have this implemented so that you can hold yourself accountable to actually doing it. Cause it's not going to be fun and that's okay. Yeah. I mean, the, the accountability of having a deadline, it, it's been so critical in my business. I know I mean, here's the deal, guys. Myself, Lisa, and Tom are some of the best friends. These are two of my best friends in the world. And we all met through the Tom Ferry coaching organization years ago. And then we created this friendship over time. But we had this commonality of seeking the accountability that Chris is talking about. We each have had a coach really forever, right? Do we have somebody in our corner that's holding us accountable? to the deadlines, to what we need to get done, to making sure that we're accepting the training, whether it be through um, through that resource, through our local uh, leader, through our team leader, whatever the case may be. And then are we actually accountable to implementing it and creating uh, the structure within our life and with our business to move forward? So what you're saying there is absolutely so true. There's 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 changes to the forms that are going to come. There's changes to the buyer representation, buyer to changes to the listing uh, presentation. And when we try to do that all on our own shoulders, that's when we create, uh, you know, something that never gets done. It, it builds and builds each and every single day. So creating that accountability is absolutely critical. Um, I, I got a couple questions, housekeeping replay will definitely be located in BAMX. Uh, Ryan says, imagine not being a BAMX member. Can't imagine it, Ryan. Uh, use code MADNESS to get into BAMX right now. We're going to be having an after party. The after party link is in BAMX Facebook group. If you're signing up right now, I see so many of you doing that. If you sign up right now using code MADNESS, check the email, go to the BAMX Facebook group. You'll get accepted immediately with people in the back end doing that. And you'll get in. The link is going to be on the Facebook group. Uh, it's where we're going to do a lot of live Q&A right there. Um uh, we, we see a bunch of comments on VA. Chris, you've got a ton of experience um, building a team. Lisa, yeah. Tom, I just see a bunch of comments. I know we're going to answer spe more specific questions inside BAMX, but it's one that I continue to, to see. Yeah. Rachel I, just posted it again, um, talking about VA and, and the dynamics would, on the, around that particular buyer loan. I think we'll start to see, like think about it this way, veterans in the US are a big deal. Right. I can't imagine a world where our government or our like the people in charge of this country just decide all of a sudden that we're going to marginalize veterans. Right. Because they, a lot of the time, zero down, right, can't necessarily afford to pay. 
I can't imagine a world where if this goes down, like they say it's going to, they just turn their back, not only just on the VA buyers, but also like FHA, USADA loans, all those cool things. Um, I'm sure we'll see some sort of, if not exception or some sort of guideline or ruling around how they can make it work. I just can't imagine a world where they throw those people under the bus. Here's the other thing I know about VA buyers, Lisa, I'm going to go to you next. VA buyers um, that I've seen in, in based on my experience uh, are not folks with no money. No. Okay. Let's clear that up. There's a accurate. lot of v yeah. VI, VA buyers who have a lot of cash reserves. Yep. And I also find VA buyers um, in particular to be those of the mindset who want to be educated throughout the process and want to align themselves with the right buyer representation. Okay. So when you have this great presentation, whether it's a VA buyer or others, I actually, I actually think you're going to have a better opportunity there um, was in, based on my experience with some of those VA buyers. Lisa, jump in on that. I was going to say, I think that there's going to be some creative workarounds with the structuring of contracts early on. Um, I think I have to get super clear on, I know it says that the VA buyers can't pay commissions. And I think there's some structuring at looking at whether it's actually a commission or a fee for service or structuring it again, go back to it, being able to structure offers, um, one of the things that we've tossed around within the office here is putting in the offer and having the seller agree to pay a percentage above that goes to buyer agency commission and closing cost credits that don't go towards commissions in a way that a, a whole bunch of different avenues. And I think, again, plan A, plan B, plan C, right, have a couple of different options, understand that it's still so new, um, but I cannot imagine a world where our government doesn't back our veterans who have given so much to serve Fact. the country. Uh, and I just want—I just got a, a text in from the BAM team. The, the I forgot this is not a private web. This is on YouTube. So where can you catch the replay? Right here on the At Now BAM channel, or if you're on the At Knowledge Brokers podcast channel, we streamed into both of those live tabs. So make sure you subscribe to this channel. Make sure you subscribe to At Knowledge Brokers. Uh, podcast channel as well. Um, Bobby, if you want to put the knowledge broker slide up there, uh, grab that QR code, they can. Myself, Lisa, and Tom do this every single week. Hit the thumbs up if you want want us to have Chris uh, have Chris jump into uh, a knowledge broker's podcast with us in the future. We'd love to have Chris on the pod. We've had so many housing analysts. Uh, we've had Lance Lambert. We, we've had Logan Motoshami from Housing Wire. We've had Danielle Hale from Realtor.com. We've had so many of them. George Ratu from Keeping Current Matters. So many of them join us throughout the um, throughout the past months here, throughout the past year that we've been doing the pod. Um, that's one place you'll be able to see the replay in the live tab. And then here on this channel, which so many of you, thank you for tuning in, have tuned in. So hit the subscribe. That link is going to live here in the live tab forever for BAMX members. It'll obviously be uploaded on the back end for you. Also for BAMX members, we're going to be jumping into our after party here in just a few moments. If you are not a BAMX member, use code um, use code MADNESS to get your 20% off of the BAMX membership. You're going to get to the price tab and be like, oh my God, I get all this value for that number. And you get 20% off on top of that. We upload new courses every single month. We have live streams and office hours every single month. We have the Facebook community. We deliver a full two to three pages of hot sheet show notes every single day. So many of you are copy and pasting that data and using it in your marketing emails, in your uh, social media. We post slides in there every single day, Monday through Thursday that we do the hot sheet. There's so much. I, I would argue that there's not a single um, database in the industry that has this much being uploaded each and every single day. Nobody creates more free content then bam, uh, all of our articles, no paywall, all these podcasts, if we're talking about it, writing about it, it will and always will be for free. If we're showing you how to do it, that's where it's going to live inside of BAMX. Uh, this BAM team's unbelievable. There, there is not another resource creating as much each and every single day. Are we perfect? Absolutely not. Uh, if we make a mistake like I did with my audio in the first seven minutes, we'll freaking own that. Um, but Join us here in BAMX. We've got the BAMX after party here starting momentarily using code MADNESS to get your 20% off of that. Also, BAMX members get a major discount to each and every single one of our events. We have an event in D.C. 
on June 6th, BAM Camp. Um, so we'll drop a link here down below. The link will be in the description for everybody watching the replay. If you want to join us in D.C., Tom and Lisa uh, will be in Washington, D.C. for the first BAM Camp of the year. That's on June the 6th. There'll be uh, a mastermind feature on June 5th for those that want to join. Uh, Nicole, there is a link on this video to join BAM X. Uh, let's go final thoughts. Um, Chris, Tom, then Lisa, then we're going to join into the BAM X party. Just a final message, short message for everybody um, who's attended here today. Yeah, I would just, uh, I would end on this. If not now, then when, right? Are you going to make these changes and get the ball rolling? Um, and it is exponentially easier to navigate change with a smile on your face. And I know that sounds like a bunch of hippie shit, but at the end of the day, it's true. Um, so yeah, rock and roll, get after it. I've been through a financial meltdown. I've been through a pandemic where we were the most aggressively shut down state in the country. And you know what happened to my business and our business here at the team every time? We took market share. And we're going to see more of that happening here because, Chris, you, you put those three buckets in there. That is the buffalo, right? The buffalo is the only animal in the animal kingdom that charges the storm. That's who you want to be in a confusing, uncertain time like this. There's a lot of opportunity out there, ladies and fellows who are watching. Take advantage and get in the right environment where that activity and that behavior is promoted, not looked down upon. And my advice is to take the opportunity, seize it, recognize it for what it is, and be ready to start thinking creatively about the strategies, not just one, not just two, maybe not even just three or four, but what are all of the different strategies that you can start to implement, start to try out, today to find these strategies that are going to set you up to really crush it on a move forward. Uh, I'd love for the team in the background, for those still in the live chat, we'll put it in the description for the replay um, to link up Sharon's video from earlier in the week. One of the best one hour pieces that you can watch to create certainty in your business. Um, we also have the link for um, for the Tom Ferry and Jack Miller, Jack Miller being from Swanapole um, discussion tomorrow. Uh, I've already heard that the signups on that have broken zoom zoom and TF have been communicating back and forth. How the heck did you break the zoom signups? We haven't seen anything like this. Okay. There's a link to sign up for that. They've solved the problem. So many of you, I know are already attending. If you did, if you don't have it on your schedule, get that on your schedule. Okay. I also want you guys to throw up the link to Chris's Instagram. I know we did earlier, but for those of you that missed um, uh, Chris's Instagram, put Chris's Instagram on there, put Lisa and Tom's um, IG on there and uh, make sure that you're following these guys. I mean, Chris is coming out with so many thoughts around the industry and it's somebody who has, somebody who everybody needs to know is, is Cristiano, somebody who's got more experience than the majority of the industry in everything that he's done through building a team, building a brokerage, and obviously his time at Zillow and what he's doing now to build Humanize. If you want to check out Humanize, that's humanize.io. So um, love it. Uh, Gregory said the first time he watched me, he hated me. That is a reaction that most people, I'm paraphrasing. Um, <laughs> Lisa sure loves that. All. Same. <laughs> Lisa loves that. He, she I think Lisa, Byron still he, hates me. I've like he's come to like on my family vacations, and I, I still I'm like he's just angry at me for inviting him places. I I don't know. Uh, Greg Greg says the first time I watched Byron, I, I thought he was a, a loser. No, I thought he had an attitude. Um, then I watched another and another. Now I realize. Uh, oh, Greg's kissing your that. butt. So, uh, this isn't good. How much you did you Venmo Greg this? prior to this live? Greg, thank you. Can we um, block him from the comments? Yeah, I appreciate that, Greg. Greg. We Shout need out to check to Greg's Gregory Venmo Alfred. history. Greg, throw me a DM, man. Love to connect with you. Uh, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Lisa, Tom, Chris, jumping on here. Um, if you guys got time, join me in the BAMX after party. We're going to go into the BAMX after party now. We'll be starting that here in just a couple of minutes. And we're just going to have a huge Zoom session where we go through question after question after question and work through them together. So, um, the link for the Zoom for the BAMX party is in the Facebook group. So go over to the BAMX Facebook group. If you just signed up, there is an email that came to you. 
um, that links you into the Facebook group, or you can go search Facebook group, uh, request the ad. They'll cross reference if you're a BAMX member and put you in there. The link to the Zoom is right inside of the BAMX Facebook. Heading into the after party now. Thank you guys so much. Let's continue to rise uh, all tides here in the industry. We are going to be more, as Lisa would say, we're going to be more than okay moving forward. Thank you guys.